Good to go. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Securing Your Serverless Journey. I'm Sanjeev Rampal. I'm a principal engineer at Cisco, and I'm also a CNCF ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter, Ron Harnick, who is a senior product man marketing manager at Prisma Cloud by Palo Alto Networks. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, during the webinar, you will not be able to talk as an attendee. Uh, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions at the end. Note, please do not put your questions in the chat window. Please put them in the Q&A window. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful of yourself, um, your fellow participants and presenters. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Ron to kick off today's presentation. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. Thanks for the, um, for the opportunity. Um, yeah, so just a little bit of uh, context of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, an introduction to serverless security. So we're We'll discuss a little bit about what serverless is at a fairly high level, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then we'll get into what are some of the risks or some of the things that you have to think about differently uh, when you're trying to secure uh, serverless workloads. And then at the end, we'll do um, a fun little demo just to understand how uh, one might carry out a serverless attack. Um, so just real quick about myself. Um, so my name is Ron. I'm part of the Prisma Cloud product marketing team. Prisma Cloud is the uh, cloud native security platform from Palo Alto Networks. Um, so over the past 10 years or so, I've been in the IT and networking and security and cloud space, moving around between um, all these different companies. I started out as a network engineer and then slowly moved through uh, different roles within the engineering organizations and product before I eventually sold out and uh, moved to a marketing role. Um, so I was with uh, PureSec, the serverless security platform that was acquired by Palo Alto Networks, um, I think just over six months ago. And then I uh, got the opportunity to join the Prisma Cloud product marketing team. So even though now I get to talk about um, cloud native security as a whole. Uh, serverless is still something that I'm very passionate about. So I'll take every opportunity that uh, I can to yell at my laptop about uh, serverless. So, uh, so thank you for giving me another one of those opportunities. Um, I live in Israel with my wife and my two uh, beautiful twin girls, which I'm obsessed with throwing a picture in them of them in everything I do. So here's a picture of them now. All right, so let's uh, quickly go over the agenda for today. And uh, just like we said at the top, please feel free to send your questions uh, through the Q&A panel. I'll try to get to most of these as I go along. Um, but uh, if there'll be any un unanswered questions by the time we wrap up, uh, we'll try to get to those in the end. So we'll start off by covering what serverless security is in a nutshell um, at a high level and make sure um, that we all understand just generally how a function-based application uh, works. We'll focus on a few risks and pitfalls. Obviously, there's a lot that we can talk about and we can even broaden the discussion to cover application security as a whole, um, but we'll very much focus on function-based applications and, um, and we'll take a look at a few of the things that you need to be on the lookout there. And then we'll wrap it up by um, doing a quick demo of how we might carry out an attack. And I'll, I'll tell a fun little story that, uh, that happened to us while we were at PureSec that I think really helps illustrate um, the importance of uh, permissions on, on functions. Um, so yeah, it should be a good time. Okay, so the first part of almost any conversation that you have about cloud security, not just serverless security, almost always starts with this idea of the shared model of responsibility. And I'm sure most of you on this webinar have heard this um, a million times. Um, when you move to the cloud, when you start using something like a Google Cloud Platform or AWS or any other public cloud platform, um, the shared model of responsibility at its simplest form divides into two. Um, the cloud provider is responsible for the security of the cloud. So that is 
anything like the data centers themselves or um, anything underneath the virtualization layer that you care about. And you, as a user, you care about the security in the cloud. So everything that you put into these workloads, so your code, the user permissions into, into these workloads, things like that. With serverless, there's an interesting shift that, uh, that happens within that model. So when you're talking about infrastructure um, as a service, uh, you're essentially taking a, a lot of responsibility to, uh, on, you're taking basically a big part of that pie as responsibility for yourself. You own pretty much anything that sits above that uh, lowest level of virtualization. So anything beyond, for example, like an EC2 instance is completely your responsibility. Um, so fixing patches in your uh, operating systems and uh, scanning your images for vulnerabilities, all that kind of stuff, uh, preventing data leaks is completely your responsibility while the cloud provider really only cares about the physical infrastructure and the configuration of like the underlying infrastructure beneath the virtualization. When you go serverless or when you start, uh, this is offset a little bit, sorry about that. So, but when you adopt uh, more of a, a serverless framework, um, there's something really interesting that happens to this split where the cloud provider actually takes uh, on a lot of responsibility and you take on less responsibility when it comes to what is left to secure. So it almost ends up being like this 50-50 split. Um, and it's interesting for someone in my position because working for a security company, typically you would go up on stage and you would talk about this scary new technology uh, that you have to do all these things in order to, to leverage successfully. While with serverless, the conversation is more uh, like you just have to think about a few things differently, but your starting point in terms of security is actually pretty strong because now you don't have to think about um, patching your operating system. You don't have to think about networking or a big list of, um, of other things that you used to have to worry about. Obviously, there are new attack vectors and new things that you have to worry about. And most of the things that are relevant to application security as you know them today are still going to be relevant. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to be covering today. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, um, I try to, to make this as accessible as possible to folks who are um, veterans with serverless and folks who are new uh, to serverless workloads. And even the term serverless can be sort of like a point of contention in terms of what it actually means. But for the sake of our discussion today, I'm talking specifically about um, applications that are based around uh, functions. So around function as a service, um, services like Lambda or uh, Google Cloud Functions, for example. So typically how these applications would work is something like this. You would have a developer commit code to a code uh, repository, and then that code will go into a function, for example, um, an AWS Lambda function. Then that code would sit there and it would wait to be triggered um, by some sort of an event. So some sort of an event will happen. It will trigger this piece of code then the function will do whatever it is it was uh, designed to do. Maybe it will interact with another cloud resource, or maybe it will just have some sort of output. For example, in a little bit, we'll be covering um, a serverless application that is essentially used for HR, for hiring. So someone sends an email with a PDF resume attached to it, That's get, that, get insert, that gets intercepted by um, a cloud service that uh, then triggers a Lambda function. And then that Lambda function takes that file, converts it to text, and puts it in a um, database table. So roughly follows the, um, the sequence of events that we're seeing here. The, the core of, um, of serverless, or the core of uh, these types of uh, function as a service uh, tools that you can use, is that typically this will be a very small piece of code that represents like a microservice. Uh, it will usually not be some massive like monolith of, uh, of code. Um, it's very much towards the cloud native approach of adopting microservices uh, because these functions will typically be uh, short lived. So they'll typically live for only about 15 minutes. So it's really not a discussion of should you go 100% serverless or should you go, um, should you evolve from, for example, <clears throat> containers into serverless? It's more of like a spectrum, right? A spectrum of compute options 
where you might have your um, virtual machines on one side and you'll have uh, something like, uh, like Fargate or Google Cloud Run and then you might have something like Lambda or Cloud Functions. Um, and every different tool is gonna be good for different types of jobs. All right, so if we agree that this is a good baseline for how an application looks like uh, when it's based on, on functions, let's talk a little bit about what are some of the attack vectors or attack surfaces that, uh, that we need to talk about. And most of these are gonna be familiar uh, to you if, um, if uh, application security is something that you've been uh, interested in. Okay, so let's say that this guy is uh, our attacker. Um, let's focus on uh, what ways, uh, not what, what the actual risks are, but what are the paths that uh, he could possibly take in order to compromise our application. So the first and maybe the most um, unique to serverless that, uh, that we need to take a look at is event data injection. And uh, I'm sure we're familiar with injection attacks like SQL injection, uh, for example, but with serverless, you have to remember that there are thousands of event sources that you could potentially use in order to trigger your function. So it's, uh, it's not necessarily going to be um, an HTTP header that uh, we can be very familiar with, uh, with uh, the fields and the cookies and, um, and the different parameters within there, but it can be an S3 bucket or it can be a Kinesis stream or you know, any of those types of things. Each one of those event sources is gonna have its own structure and its own format um, of um, how it conveys information. And those are things that could potentially be manipulated in order to compromise the, the function. Another would be unauthorized deployment. So this would be, for example, a, a phishing attack where someone was able to deploy code out of band uh, directly into your um, uh, Lambda function, for example, uh, because they got the credentials to your AWS account or anything uh, in, a, in that way. Um, something that's gonna be less far-fetched and much more common, not just in serverless, but in application security in general, is gonna be dependency poisoning. Um, and dependency poisoning, really what we mean here is uh, you've used some sort of open source uh, third-party um, library within your application, within your code, and there's a vulnerability, a CV or, or something else uh, within that NPM package or whatever that uh, dependency might be. Um, and this is exactly, uh, or at least part of what the whole discussion around shift left revolves around. Like you have to be able to detect vulnerabilities as early as possible in the life cycle to make sure that they don't make it all the way into your um, production environment, serverless or otherwise. So that would be something to, to look out for. Um, this vector, I just wanna add uh, dependency poisoning, it's something that is that exists as an attack vector in pretty much all forms of application security. Specifically with serverless, the challenge is gonna be how do you detect that and um, what can the attacker actually do if they compromised your function. And finally, the, the last vector that I wanna talk about is uh, tampering with data or really compromising the cloud services that your function interacts with. So a typical um, function-based application or serverless application is not going to be made just out of um, functions. You're gonna have maybe a storage bucket talking to a function that's talking to um, a database table and maybe that is talking to another function or maybe you have a website where you have multiple different functions doing uh, the login or one is loading the pictures and one is uh, storing all the user data, whatever it might be. There's going to be interaction to a lot of different cloud sources uh, within that process. Um, if one of those other services gets compromised, then that entire application could get compromised. And that's actually exactly the example that I'm going to walk through in just a little bit and, and a, little, uh, a little story that we put together for you. So I think the most famous example of this is um, uh, S3 buckets that are open to the internet. So maybe your function itself is locked down tight, but it stores lots of data on an S3 bucket that is open to the internet, and then an attacker might be able to compromise your function uh, through there. What can an attacker actually hope to achieve uh, with uh, these types of attacks? Well, these are typically the same things that you will find with uh, typical application security. Um, so they might be able to compromise data. So for example, let's say that you have a function that's talking to a DynamoDB table. 
um, if that function has permissions to essentially do whatever it wants with that DynamoDB table, once that function is compromised, um, then the attacker will be able to exfiltrate data from the uh, DynamoDB table that uh, they're talking to, which again is relevant to the example that, uh, that we'll see in a little bit. So this is just a quick overview of some of the vectors that uh, you might need to look out for with uh, serverless. So um, what can you do to educate yourself about this? Uh, so one thing that I would definitely, definitely recommend um, is to read this white paper from the Cloud Security Alliance. Um, this is something that a lot of different uh, experts from different companies came together and put this together. Definitely not uh, product related. So it's not a product pitch for any, any specific product. It focuses on functions. And it's uh, essentially the OWASP top 10 version for serverless. So this white paper, uh, which is very long and very exhaustive, um, uh, I would still, if you're considering serverless or using serverless, I would very much recommend that you uh, go through it and read it, uh, just because it goes into much more detail than we'll have time uh, for today for what are the attack vectors that, uh, that you should be worried about or should uh, be on the lookout for, what can you do to harden your applications, um, and it also just has a lot of really great insights about how function uh, as a service tools work. So I can't, cannot recommend this enough. Um, and this was done by the Cloud Security Alliance, which is a fantastic uh, organization. All right. So um, if we kind of likened the uh, security on serverless application to the applications to application security in general, let's talk a little bit about what, why we need um, serverless security or security that is specific or purpose-built for serverless? Well, with traditional security, you're essentially protecting applications um, with tools that are being deployed on servers or networks. With serverless, you don't have access to any of that un underlying infrastructure. So for example, if you have that S3 bucket that's talking to your Lambda function, there's nowhere for you to put a firewall between those two. Um, if you're uh, only using something, uh, for example, that looks at, um, at API requests, at HTTP headers, that's only going to cover a small percentage of the things that could trigger your functions. So that is typically where you have to think about this a little bit differently. So with serverless, the application owner doesn't have any control over the infrastructure. So um, traditional uh, security tools, I don't know if traditional is the, the right word here, but traditional security tools um, are unsuitable to secure a uh, hundred percent of these types of environments. Having said that, I'm very much laser focused on serverless for this conversation. It is important to remember that in most environments, it's gonna be some sort of a hybrid, right? You're gonna have your serverless applications, you're gonna have your containers, you're gonna have um, your definitely your GKEs and EKS and Fargate and uh, your uh, actual VMs. So security is a much broader conversation, but specifically about uh, how do you secure, for example, um, a Lambda talking to a DynamoDB table. Yeah, you're not gonna be able to do that with um, an agent deployed on a server or, uh, or with something that inspects um, anomalies on the network. Let's take a look at how typically you would protect an application. You might have your application code, um, and uh, you might have something for uh, endpoint protection that takes a look at the behavior of the application itself. Maybe you'll have some sort of IPS um, type tool that takes a look at uh, network anomalies. Uh, you might have a, a secure web gateway that takes a look at uh, outbound traffic, or you might have some sort of firewall that uh, takes a look at inbound traffic. And uh, you'll have uh, maybe even uh, a next generation firewall taking a look at your, uh, your layer seven traffic. And all of this goes on your infrastructure. So this is a, a, you know, a 360 view of how you lock down that application very, very tight. With serverless, pretty much all of this goes away and um, your functions essentially live on the internet. And that's something that you have to be on the lookout for, right? So, uh, and this is where to me, the conversation about serverless security gets really interesting because the code that you are deploying, um, it doesn't live within a container. Uh, well, technically it does, but I mean, it doesn't live within some sort of uh, structure that you deploy uh, to the cloud, but it lives directly on 
AWS or Google or Azure or where, wherever it is you're using your FAST uh, server. So with that, the entire concept of security is pretty much reduced to strong code and strict configurations. So what can each function do? What permissions does it have? Obviously, there are other tools out there that, uh, that you can use in order to uh, take another step, but uh, those, are, those become the two strongest components of uh, serverless security. So I'd like to take uh, a quick break from uh, just uh, trying to reiterate the same point over and over again about uh, um, the difference between serverless and traditional applications. And I'd like to go through a story uh, that I think does a really good job at illustrating um, the importance of permissions with serverless applications. So this is something that happened while we were at uh, PureSec. So this was uh, before the acquisition and we just thought it was a, a fun story to share. So um, this guy, Caleb Zima, who I think uh, is with uh, Capital One now, um, he essentially put up this website called lambdashell.com. It's no longer up. Um, but what he wanted to see is, is serverless insecure? Um, is a tool like Lambda, for example, is it a security risk? Let's find out. So he threw up this website. He put um, a shell into the application on the website, and he said that um, if someone uh, is successful with hacking to, into this application, they'll give them a $1,000 bounty. So um, our CTO at the time, Ori Segal, this is him, um, saw this, and essentially he was like, okay, challenge accepted. So Ori is uh, now with us at uh, Palo Alto Networks, um, uh, leading a, a product team. Uh, but at the time, he was the CTO of uh, PureSec. So we saw that. He said, maybe this could be some good PR for us. Let's go ahead and, um, and uh, do it. OK, so the first thing that he wanted to do, uh, you already have access to this shell, right? So from uh, so remote code execution, essentially like the holy grail of, uh, of uh, application security, uh, he thought he was most of the way done already. So the first thing that he tried to do is to get the environment variables. And all of this is no longer online. So that's why we have no problem, you know, putting this on a, on a public webinar. But um, he tried to get the environment variables uh, from, uh, uh, from the shell in order to try to impersonate the Lambda function. So he exported the uh, secret access key and the access key uh, to his own machine. And uh, then when he did SDS get caller identity, essentially he tried to check how does, AWS, how does AWS seize uh, me as the role of this function, he saw that he actually assumed the role of this function. So he effectively impersonated the function itself. Um, so in his mind, he was essentially in, like he did it. So right after that, Ori was walking around, I'm the smartest man alive, this is awesome. Um, he was genuinely very, <laughs> very happy. Um, Afterwards, he tried playing around with the IAM permissions a little bit. So he tried to list the different functions. He tried to run a few commands. Um, and uh, he saw that he failed miserably. Now, this is interesting because he got access to where the code is, right? He got access to the function. So in any other form of application security, that could have been game over. But because there was a strict IAM profile around that Lambda function, um, then he wasn't able to really do anything other than what uh, this function is, uh, is supposed to do. So there were pretty strict IAM permissions. So it's, uh, it's kinda, it kind of reduced the blast radius around that function, if that makes sense. So again, he tried to um, do a few more uh, commands to see if, uh, if he has the uh, permissions and he kept getting these uh, access denied. Um, so at this point, he was pretty bummed out, just like moping around uh, the office because, um, you know, at a startup, you have to move fast and you have to constantly be delivering stuff at just like breakneck speeds. And he was wasting, you know, like a couple of days on it. It was not a good time at the office. Um, then uh, one of our researchers uh, suggested that there's, uh, there's probably an S3 bucket involved. Uh, just, and typically, uh, best practice is usually to use the domain name for the name of the bucket where you host uh, the files for it. So um, he ran this command, uh, head bucket, and he saw that he didn't get anything in return. 
And essentially what uh, this prompted him to, to think is, uh, is this some sort of quirk of AWS or um, maybe there is a bucket there? Um, and, uh, and maybe, uh, so because he saw that he was not getting an error or like a permission denied. So he tried a few times. Uh, he tried to do the same command with uh, just another random domain name, and then he saw that he did get the 404. So this confirmed from him for him that this uh, original bucket does really exist. Okay, so he was able to list the different objects um, within there, uh, and uh, he saw that he did gain some some sort of access into um, this S3 bucket, and his next step was to see, do I actually have write permissions? Can I actually do something um, with this bucket? So maybe he was a little bit drunk off of uh, the champagne that he had earlier, but uh, his first idea was to delete the index.html file that, uh, that he found there, which of course immediately crashed the website. And again, this is interesting because the function was locked down tight, but the S3 bucket wasn't. Um, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, how you have to take a look at the permissions that wrap around all of the different components of, um, of a serverless application. So after this, he immediately got a phone call from, uh, from Caleb. Um, and uh, Caleb was, uh, was at the time, I think it was either uh, DEF CON or, or Red Hat, but he was in Vegas at, uh, at a conference and he was talking about this and, and showing the website and we completely crashed it for him. Um, but we were able to take the website down before uh, any of our competitors could, which was fun. Uh, but we never did get that thousand dollars. So um, a key component in that story, one of the main uh, characters there was uh, I am, um, identity and access management. Uh, typically that's the way it's called across all the different clouds. Most of my examples here were on AWS just because uh, that's uh, uh, where most of this happened. So um, let's talk a little bit about what you can actually do in order to leverage I am uh, to secure these types of applications. So um, the challenge with the least privileged approach, which is I think pretty unanimously the best approach you could possibly have with, with uh, serverless or with functions, it will essentially mean that um, you want each function to only be able to do the very least that it, uh, that it can or just exactly the task that, uh, that it's supposed to do and nothing else. So for example, if you have a function that all it's supposed to do is to uh, put files in a DynamoDB table, then that should be everything that that function is allowed to do. Um, the model around uh, around IAM is extremely powerful. It just it's hard to get right uh, because what do you do when you have thousands of uh, different functions, right? It gets challenging uh, at scale. So the problem typically is introduced with uh, the human factor, and it becomes very uh, tempting to uh, use that um, star button, right? A wildcard in your permissions that essentially will give a function complete permission into whatever it is that, uh, that it's interacting with. The issues around functions having more permissions than they should are probably the most common serverless security issues that we're seeing out there. Obviously, serverless uh, is still on the rise. It's still something that is um, in the middle of adoption, it's not as mainstream as containers just yet, but uh, I mean, with the rate that tools like uh, Google Cloud Functions and Lambda have been growing, uh, there's no doubt that it's um, on its way. So for example, if all the function actually has to do is to put items in a DynamoDB table, but with the permissions you see here, there's a star, it means that if that function is, um, if that function is compromised, it means that that DynamoDB table, regardless of, uh, of its own permissions, will definitely be compromised. So when I do this session live, uh, I like to do a, a quick quiz at uh, this point and talk about uh, how we, um, how you can kind of name and uh, how you have to know how to name and spell the correct time permissions. Obviously, we're not going to do that here. Um, but uh, what we typically talk about is how do you spell the exact permission to put item for DynamoDB? Um, because uh, the permissions, when you're talking about what the function can do and what a user can do, they look a little bit different. So you have to make sure that you read the documentation and that you uh, use the, uh, the correct right, the correct uh, form. Um, if you do end up giving your function just a, 
a wild card in the permission, just a total permission to uh, do whatever it needs to do with um, that DynamoDB table, uh, this is everything that it will be able to do. So it will be able to completely annihilate that DynamoDB table. Um, and I'm, I just keep using the same tools for this example, because I feel that if I'll start mentioning millions of different tools, it might just get too confusing. So I'm sticking to Lambda and DynamoDB just because that's the example that we'll be looking at. So you can take, uh, you can think about IAM permissions uh, kind of like bulkheads in a submarine or on a ship, right? Even if the function itself or whatever service that uh, that that IAM profile is wrapped around, even if that gets compromised, uh, the blast radius is pretty much contained, exactly like a bulkhead on a on a submarine. Uh, that function can only put more stuff into that DynamoDB table. It's not ideal, but it's better if uh, that function was compromised and it had just a wildcard in the permissions. It's better uh, than you know that uh, table being completely compromised. Okay, so a few quick tips uh, for getting IAM permissions right. So uh, like we said, trying to adopt a role per function model where you have a specific role for each function that only gives it least privileged uh, exactly what it needs to be able to do. Think twice before hitting shift eight. Uh, the eight here is missing. It'll pop up here in a little bit. Um, SAM managed policies are your friend. There's a, an example uh, for this as well, and there's an equivalent with a serverless framework uh, for this as well. So here's an example of what not to do. Uh, Amazon DynamoDB full access, just the equivalent of putting a star in that profile. Here's a better thing to do where you only give CRUD permissions um, to one specific table um, and here's the even better thing that uh, you can do. Uh, give, the, uh, give your function just a very specific action that it should be allowed to do for each, uh, for each function. Um, there is a free least privileged IAM automatic role generator, which is an open source tool that, uh, that you could use. Um, still available for now. I'll, I'll link it a little bit later. But um, it's, still, it's still out there for now. So I'll, I'll have a link for that at the end of the uh, slide. All right. So. Um, before we wrap up, let's take a look at a quick example, and I think this uh, would be uh, a good way to a good thing to end on. Um, let's take a look at a sample application that we have uh, built out uh, as an example for how you might carry out such an attack. So um, we have this uh, CV filtering system, this HR uh, automated application that we've built that is completely based on um, serverless uh, tools, so Lambda and other abstracted services uh, from AWS in this case. And essentially what it does, a candidate will send an email with uh, a PDF attached to it, a resume, that will get intercepted by simple email service and they'll get um, a receipt back, just an email back saying like, hey, we got your resume, thanks. And um, then that triggers an SNS queue, and uh, sorry, an SNS topic. And then that topic will trigger a Lambda function. All that Lambda function does is essentially it receives the uh, PDF, it converts it to text, and it stores it in a DynamoDB table. If you've been following around this presentation, you probably know where uh, this is going. But this is the application that we have here built out. So let's, uh, let's take a look at it. So I have this uh, Gmail account open here. Since this application rests on uh, essentially receiving emails with PDFs attached to them, so there's no kind of web portal for me or like web page uh, for me to, to attack. So first, let's see that the application works um, as, a, as it should. So in the subject, let's say my CV. This is my CV attached. And uh, let's go ahead and... Uh, attach my johnsmith.pdf file. So I'm going to send this over and uh, the application will work as we, um, as we saw it illustrated. The, uh, the uh, file will get intercepted by a simple email service. It will talk to SNS. It will talk to Lambda and we'll do the whole things. And in about 10 seconds, we should get uh, a receipt back. So here it is. Um, thank you for contacting us. One of our recruiters will contact you shortly. Great. The application is working as expected. Now, let's say for the sake of discussion that I did not get the job, 
Um, and uh, now it has become my sole purpose in life to destroy this company that uh, didn't give me the job. So I want to do a bit of reconnaissance, right? I want to understand a little bit about uh, this, uh, this application. So let's try this um, HR email again. And once again, let's say this is my CV. And this time, um, essentially, if you think about it, I don't really have a lot to work with here, except for the name of the file. So obviously, there's there are a few more steps of reconnaissance that we might be able to do, but we don't have too much time here. So, uh, so <laughs> you'll have to trust me that we fake did uh, a few more steps of reconnaissance. But what I'm trying to see as the attacker here is, can I affect the code? Can I do like a code injection attack into this application? So essentially, um, will I be able to pass this command into the code of the application? Does it accept user input as is? So I'll attach this and I'll say, this is my CV honest. And uh, let's go ahead and, and send this again. Now, we're not going to wait 5,000 seconds to see that we're not going to get uh, the, uh, the alert back, uh, the, the receipt back. You're going to have to trust me that uh, we won't um, because the function will time out. So once I've done this and I saw that, uh, OK, uh, I do have a path into the application, I can go ahead and start my attack. And the way that uh, I want to start this attack, and this is really interesting because, again, the code rests directly on AWS with this case because it's Lambda behind the scenes. Um, so let's say again, my CV. And here, let's say, how could you? Let's attach another one of these files. And you see that now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to curl a script from Pastebin um, into this application. And essentially what this script will do is it will try to read the application code and send it back to me over email. So I'm going to head and uh, attach this. Let's send this over. Um, we can actually take a, take a look at the uh, code in the meantime. So this is that code. This is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to read the application code and then I'm trying to send this back uh, to the email address. Uh, let's see if uh, we're getting anything back. Should be getting something in a little bit. And here we see that, uh, that we did get first another receipt. So this is the first receipt that we got and we got another one. And second, we see that we got the function code. Um, let's see what we got here. So this is the actual code of, uh, of the function. Um, this is really what I'm after. Let's say that I'm gonna exact my revenge in the form of data leakage. I'm going to steal the data from the other candidates and I'm going to, I don't know, sell it. I don't know what you do with it. So I can see that there are some security practices in here. So for example, I see that they're checking that the file ends with .pdf, uh, which is uh, okay. But uh, I'm also seeing that um, they are accepting essentially user input here. So everything after the colon, like it was John colon, and then I curled the, the script there, um, is essentially accepted into this code and, uh, and I'm able to execute that. So this is what I'm interested in. I can see that there's a DynamoDB table. This is where if all the permissions that this function really had was um, to just put items in this DynamoDB table, there isn't too much damage that I would have been able to do. Maybe I would have, would have been able to like crash the function or like time it out or do some sort of small like DOS attack, but uh, I would have, wouldn't have been able to steal the database, which I, I will be able to do now because I'm going to send one last email, I swear. And let's just say full on villain mode. Um, and let's attach this final file. And this is just, again, another pastebin script that um, essentially what it does is it um, reads, it scans the uh, DynamoDB table, and then it will exfiltrate it. We can actually take a look at the, that script as well. So we can take a look at it here. Essentially, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to scan the um, the DynamoDB table, and then I'm try I want to uh, exfiltrate that data, dump it back into the email, send it back to me here. 
and we see that we actually did get it. So I got a DynamoDB dump. This is all the information from in there with all the emails and personal information for lots and lots of candidates. Um, I think the most interesting thing here is that this is not a vulnerability of, uh, of AWS or Google Cloud or wherever you run the function. This is a vulnerability in the code that, uh, that the developer wrote. In this case, it's us, but um, this is something actually pretty common. It's because the code is running directly on the, the cloud platform and the vulnerability in the code itself that we were able to do this. So if you think about it, um, in this case, AWS didn't do anything wrong, right? Uh, because the function has permissions to read its own code and to export it, and it has the permissions to do, um, and it had the permissions to read the uh, DynamoDB uh, table. So if you take a look at your CloudWatch um, uh, logs or CloudTrail or anything really, you're not gonna see anything out of the ordinary. So it just illustrates the importance of uh, having type permissions around your functions. And um, obviously there are tools out there that you can use to uh, take security to the next step, but. Uh, uh, but at the most basic level, that is something that you're, you're able to leverage, as well as just being aware of the importance of having um, strong code. All right, so just the last thing that I want to wrap up on uh, in terms of uh, taking action and, and maybe uh, getting more familiar with this. So once again, I cannot recommend enough the uh, 12 most critical uh, risks for serverless by the Cloud Security Alliance. Great, great white paper, very educational for you to go over read what are the risks, be aware of them. Um, at least some of them are obviously more advanced, but the first few ones really are, are the ones that you need to watch out for. Um, you can also take a look at the OWASP serverless GOAT application. Uh, there's a link for that up here. That is um, it's essentially just a, an application that you can deploy, attack, play around with, impress your friends at parties with your serverless security skills. Um, and finally, there is a least privileged uh, CLI tool. It's currently still available. I'm not sure if it's gonna be there for, for long, so you might as well grab it. It's not uh, the end all be all of, um, of uh, IAM security, but it's a tool that uh, you can use in order to generate a baseline for a least privileged uh, IAM role. So that's definitely something that, uh, that you can take a look at. So with that, um, I'd like to thank everybody for um, joining us today, um, and uh, thank for thank you for the CNCF uh, for having me today. I hope this has been useful. That's awesome. Thank you, Ron, for a great presentation. Uh, we still have a few minutes for questions. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, please drop it into the Q and A tab. Um, I'll kick one thing off here, uh, Ron. You you mentioned that the function had permission to read and export its own code. Is that common or is that unusual? So it's, um, I mean, you, you have to remember that unless uh, uh, you, you deny something, uh, then the function will be able to do it. So in terms of being able to inspect its, uh, its own code, yeah, that's going to be the, the default behavior. Uh, and those are going to be the, the things that uh, you're going to have to watch out for, um, either with governing them with IAM profiles or finding other ways to uh, block those types of command injection attacks. Got it, thanks. Mm -hmm. Looks like Chris had a question. Yeah, so there's a question, uh, what protection does uh, PureSec offer for uh, serverless in context of Prisma? So I don't think uh, we can get too product heavy here, but uh, just uh, for it, at a high level, uh, PureSec is now part of Prisma Cloud, the uh, cloud native security platform, along with uh, Twistlock and Redlock and the other companies that uh, got, got acquired recently. Um, all of the capabilities in there are, uh, all the capabilities from these uh, companies are, have already been integrated into this tool. And uh, in terms of serverless security, then uh, you can definitely use it in order to detect and block um, the command injection attacks. Uh, behavioral protection for your functions to prevent it from running processes it's not supposed to, um, as well as uh, getting um, a very high level of visibility into the permissions of your functions. Um, so a lot of cool stuff that, uh, that you can do in there for that. But we have a lot of uh, good resources for that online. So we have another question. How does a security policy um, uh, get stored 
uh, and apply? Is it via S3 bucket? So the security policy for um, individual functions, if we're talking specifically about the native tools that you have out there with, uh, for example, with AWS, it will typically be an IAM profile that uh, you assign uh, to the, the function. So you don't, you don't necessarily have to store it in an S3 bucket. Um, if you, um, if you're talking about uh, other tools um, like Prisma Cloud or typically uh, or, or other other security tools, then it will typically be some sort of wrapper around your code. So when uh, your function, when AWS invokes your function, so instead of calling your handler, it uh, might call uh, our handler. So we'll be able to inspect the um, event data. So that will typically be part of it. And the other part will be an authentication with the AWS account uh, to be able to do vulnerability scans and, and things like that. Um, if I can give any thought, another question is, uh, can you give us any thoughts about uh, security as it relates to alternative uh, serverless systems like OpenFast? Um, I think, so personally, I don't have too much experience with, uh, with OpenFast, but I think that um, um, it's really different once you're talking about something that, um, that you're essentially deploying. I don't know if uh, on-prem is the, the right word. Um, the security of the underlying infrastructure is still gonna be something that's uh, gonna be your responsibility in, the, in that case. Um, you're still going to have to worry about the same types of things. Uh, if you're, for example, just handing these uh, functions to developers, uh, you're still going to have to worry about the strength of your code. And I'm not sure exactly how permission uh, governance works within uh, OpenFast, but uh, I, I would imagine that, that that is still very much something that uh, you'd have to look out for. But I would say that the biggest difference is going to be that uh, you're still going to have to worry about what sits underneath while with uh, public cloud, uh, which again is just where I have some personally more experience with uh, serverless tools, um, that is something that is uh, just not even on your radar. So for example, the, the networking uh, or the operating system, like those things are, are there, but obviously they're not on your radar. Um, I hope that makes sense. Okay, um, any more questions? I think that about wraps it up. Uh, so great, thank you Ron for a great presentation. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. The webinar recording and the slides will be online later today. We look forward to seeing you again at a future CNCF webinar. Have a nice day, goodbye. Thanks everybody, bye.